You have enrolled in History of Christianity, a survey course. As we begin the course, I make two assumptions. First, I'm assuming you have or will take a course which studies the New Testament book of the Acts of the Apostles. Therefore, I do not intend to spend a great deal of time on beginnings. Second, I'm assuming you will read the course text carefully and take adequate notes. Focus on important personages, events, concepts, and dates. I'm not really a stickler for dates, but I expect you to have a grasp of the general time frame and flow of developments and where important people appear as those de developments unwind. During the course, you will take two major examinations, a midterm and a final. Each contributes significantly towards your final grade. And the midterm tests you on the data learned to the time of the exam. The final tests you on material covered from the midterm to the final. Each exam will consist of two parts. Part 1 tests your grasp of important persons, events, dates, and concepts. You will have a list from which you will make selections and write a brief identification. Your identification needs only be long enough to correctly identify the selection and its place in history. Part, Part 2 is, is more comprehensive, comprehensive and tests your knowledge of the content and context and flow of historical data. You will select a question and write an historical essay. This essay is to be much like a mini-term paper, except you don't need to provide references or footnotes. This is not intended, or this part of the test, is not intended to be short answer. In some respects, this is to be a mind dump. Tell me everything you can, and place it in its setting. Be as complete as you possibly can in answering the question. But please, don't refer to your notes. Feel free to direct any questions about the syllabus, assignments, examinations, or material covered to me. Now remember, I live in Arizona, so keep in mind that I'm on Rocky Mountain Standard Time all year round. Arizona does not observe daylight savings time. My address and phone number are on the syllabus. Okay, let's get started. Christ's church began on the day of Pentecost in the year A.D. 30. It was born in Jerusalem during the reign of Pontius Pilate. Pilate served as procurator. That was a title reserved for military governors. Perhaps a little bit of understanding about imperial rule will help. From the time of Julius Caesar until A.D. 284, the Roman emperors were generally accountable to the Senate and focused largely on global politics. The Senate selected emperors for their military acumen and leadership. For many years, they served only in times when the army went to war. They acted as the commander-in-chief of the military. By the first century, this imperial office became permanent under Caesar Augustus. Control of the empire rested with both the Senate and the emperor. Proconsuls were senatorial appointments, governors, who governed peaceful provinces. The emperor appointed pro procurators, a different kind of governor, a military governor, to govern restive or rebellious provinces. This tells us a great deal about circumstances that existed in Judea at the time of Jesus' birth. Rome was trying to placate the Jews through the rule of the Herods, but there was sufficient resistance in the province to lead the emperor to appoint a procurator, Pontius Pilate, to that region. Romans commonly looked upon those occupying the imperial throne as first among equals. Augustus was ascribed status as deity only after his death, but this is not to say Romans considered him a god on the order of Zeus or Kronos or any of the gods enshrined in the pantheon. Imperial status meant Romans honored an emperor's position and leadership ability. Domitian, who ruled when the Apostle John wrote the book of Revelation, 
was the first emperor who demanded recognition as God the Lord. He insisted people hail his greatness with terms such as Lord of the Earth, Invincible, Glory, or Holy, and he attempted to enforce all of that by force. Now, Roman religion was a bit different, too. Roman religion must not be equated in any way with the worship of deities, per se, real or imagined. At its heart, Roman religion consisted of the veneration of ancestors. Each home possessed household gods, to be sure, and sacrifices were offered to them. Oaths to maintain the family name and honor accompanied these sacrifices. The major religious concerns of the Romans was for protection, health, and the maintenance of the family heritage. No comparison can be made to Christianity, which calls for personal faith and commitment to a person. Rather, Roman religion can be summed up in terms of obligation or devotion. Worship in the cities was wrapped up in deities associated with each city. For example, Artemis, or Diana, was the god goddess of the Ephesians, and the Ephesians looked to her to provide health and safety for the city. Cities built temples to the gods, but these temples can't be compared to a church building. Roman temples were houses of the city's gods. That's where the gods and the goddesses resided. It was expected the only the city gods would protect and provide for the residents of that city. Each deity had its festival, and residents would bring sacrifices and gifts. Processions carried the gifts to the gods in an effort to curry favor. When the Romans conquered a city or territory, it simply absorbed their deities into the Roman pantheon. Romans were henotheists, meaning they believed all people worshipped the same gods but use different names to describe them. Thus, Zeus to the Greeks was Jupiter for the Romans, Poseidon was the god of the sea for the Greeks, while it was Neptune for the Romans. But the Pantheon did have one deity Romans considered extremely strange, <clears throat> and that was the god of the Jews, Jehovah. But we need to think a little bit about Jewish religion at the time the church began. Romans weren't quite sure what to do with the Jewish religion. Jews did not worship a visible deity. No statue or idol representing Jehovah <clears throat> existed in the pantheon. But they recognized Jehovah as the God of the Jews. Romans respected Judaism because it was an old faith. But for them, the Jews and Jerusalem were a mess and seemed totally disorganized. Rome believed the Jews would eventually cave and adapt to a Roman religious culture, accepting the belief that Jehovah was but one God among many. When it became obvious Jews would not accept Roman religion, the Romans tried to force the Jews to adopt their religious manners. For example, Caligula, who was emperor between AD 37 and 41, tried to put a statue of himself in the Jewish temple, thinking this would bring the Jews around. Earlier, a Roman governor had taken funds from the temple treasury to fund a variety of projects and thus raising the irritation of the Jews. The religion itself <clears throat> uh, is something of an anomaly. While the Old Testament repeatedly calls for faith, a personal trust in a living God, most Jews merely observe the trappings. For them, religion was their culture. It was who they were. And that's still true today. Taking passages from the Old Testament, too many Jews believe the rites, sacrifices, and festivals observed by the Mosaic Law made Jehovah beholden to them. Both of the two major sects in Jerusalem the Sadducees and the Pharisees majored on minors. Sadducees controlled the Sanhedrin, the Jewish governing council, and held to a strict interpretation of the Torah or the Pentateuch, 
while rejecting oral tradition. Sadducees believed free will, rejected the possibility of an afterlife, and denied the possibility of punishment or reward after death. They're the ones who held political power in Judaism as they controlled the state and international relations, collected taxes, even equipping an army. Pharisees numbered about 8,000 at the time of Christ's advent. They were spiritual liberals in, in many respects, liberals who accepted the Torah, but an oral tradition as well. Pharisees believed Moses gave an oral Torah in addition to the written one. The oral Torah con continued to grow through the debate and discussion of the scribes and the Pharisees and the lawyers. And they came from, and those groups were all Pharisees as the study of the law continued to be important to them. Pharisees believed in an unspecific resurrection of the dead. It was unspecific because they were certain it would be a bodily, uncertain if it would be a bodily resurrection. Now let me repeat that just to make sure I don't mess up too much. It was unspecific because they were uncertain if this resurrection would be bodily. Pharisees believed only the spirit or the soul was immortal and would be reincarnated in another body. Pharisees also believed in free will, but believed God knew their ultimate destiny. And although we hear most about Pharisees and Sadducees, there were several other minor groups among the Jews as well. The Herodians, for example, were a Hellenistic political party favorable to the rule of the Herods. Rome declared Herod the great king of Judea in 40 BC. After the death of Herod the Great, there was no king in Judea until the appointment of Herod Agrippa in AD 41. Herodians were favorable to the reinstitution of the Herodian dynasty during the time of Jesus, and they tended to favor Rome. Zealots opposed Roman rule and worked tirelessly to bring about their expulsion. Extremely militant zealots tried to incite the Jews to rebel against Roman rule. The Gospel accounts list Simon the Zealot as one of the twelve. The Sakari were a terrorist sect among the Zealots. Members of the Sakari carried out assassinations and instigated violence against Romans in an attempt to overthrow their rule. Scripture never mentions the Sakari, nor does it mention the Essenes. The Essenes were an austere sect which retreated to the region of the Dead Sea and kept to themselves. They were strictly ascetic, believing in celibacy, piety, and a life of poverty. We know about the Essenes only because of the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. More than 900 documents were discovered in 11 caves near the Dead Sea between 1946 and 1956. This was a treasure trove of information uh, concerning copies of the Bible and its faithfulness, but it also gave us a lot of information about the Essenes who lived around the Dead Sea. While there may have been people of faith within all these groups, they tended to trust their observance of the Mosaic Law and the sacrifices rather than trusting the living person of God. Jewish religion was localized in Jerusalem and in Judea, but there were Jewish enclaves throughout the Roman Empire. Following the Babylonian captivity, Jews scattered throughout the known world. Followers of the Hebrew religion numbered at least 10% of the empire's population at the time of the birth of Christ. At the time of Christ, the empire's population stood at about 70 million. Thus, about 7 million Jews resided in the empire. The, the Jews that were spread about the empire in all of the different cities were simply referred to as the diaspora, the, the ones who were scattered. This fact provided a ready audience for the, to facilitate the spread of Christianity. We know Paul first went to the Jews in each community and then to the Gentiles. Let's look for a moment at the outreach and organizational structure of the early church. Christ's church grew rapidly. 
It is an interesting study to trace the growth of the church through the book of Acts. Luke reveals Paul's missionary journeys in Asia Minor and Greece and hints at his travels to Tarshish or Spain. Tradition tells us that Paul's travel may have taken him even as far as Britain. Those close to Jesus took the gospel to other lands as well. Andrew went to the land of the man-eaters in what is now Georgia, a former Soviet republic. Thomas took the gospel to Syria and perhaps as far as India. Philip had a powerful ministry in Carthage in North Africa. Matthew evangelized Persia, Ethiopia, and India. Bartholomew and Thomas spread the gospel in India, Armenia, and southern Arabia. Mark ministered in Elephantine in southern Egypt. Each of these evangelists faced martyrdom for their faith. Only John, the brother of James, the son of Zebedee, escaped martyrdom, although exiled to the island of Patmos. A growing church requires structure. The New Testament reveals two classes of leaders in the early church, general leaders and local leaders. Apostles, prophets, and teachers comprise the general leaders in the early church. Their role and function encompassed ministry to the whole church. The twelve, minus Judas Iscariot, but with the addition of Matthias and then later Paul, formed the ap apostolic leadership as the church grew. Apostles guided the formation and development of the early church. It is commonly believed the apostolic tradition or function ended when the last of the apostolic band died. Prophets were men and women especially gifted as conduits of Christ's word, of his word communication to the growing church. A prophet is one who speaks on behalf of another. See Exodus 7, verse 1. The New Testament does not fully explain the role of the prophet. A prophet's role is not so much revealing information about future events as communicating God's word. We know the early church considered Philip's two daughters prophetesses, and in the absence of written scripture, God guided the church through special revelation mediated through prophets. Accompanying the gift of prophecy, 1 Corinthians 12.10, was the gift of discernment to assure the divine, the divine origin of the message delivered. And then teachers. Teachers occupied a position like prophets, except they infallibly interpreted and applied principles and practices from the prophetic messages and written scriptures. As the New Testament canon, or approved list, formed, the need for the general leaders declined. Several miraculous spiritual gifts apparently ceased, according to 1 Corinthians 13.8. The New Testament also lists local leaders, and these were bishops, elders, and deacons, and they were leaders in local congregations. Most Protestant churches today recognize the New Testament function of bishop and elder as essentially synonymous. Passages dealing with this leadership function do not tell us the bishop occupied a higher position or held greater authority than the elder. Furthermore, except for the apostles in Jerusalem, elders meeting, and those elders meeting together in what is often called the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, there is no indication of authoritative structures outside the local church. I'll have more to say on this in another lecture. The New Testament uses three words to describe the role of an elder. Poimen, shepherd, presbyteros, elder, and episkopos, or superintendent. So elders were either shepherds, they were older, or they, and they served as superintendents. Elders then shepherded God's flock. They were older or mature in the faith. The Apostle Paul describes the character of these men as possessing wisdom, spiritual acumen, and integrity. Nothing is said in Scripture about a selection method, but Paul said elders should desire the task and see the function as an opportunity to lead and serve. He counseled Timothy and Titus to appoint elders in every city. 
The biblical, the biblical role, of the, role of the deacon is a bit foggy. A bit foggy. The word, the word diakonos, diakonos comes from a, comes a, from a word that a meant word table, that waiter. table waiter. Deacons, then, deacons are, servants are servants in the local in church. The local they church. serve they through serve a variety of tasks, tasks, usually appointed, usually by, appointed by, the by the elders. While the role While of the, the elder was limited to men, it is likely it both is likely women both and men and served, men as, served deacons. as deacons. Romans 16.1, 16, for, example, for example, introduces, introduces us, to Phoebe, us to Phoebe, who apparently who served, as served as a deacon as or, deaconess, or deaconess, although the King although James, James Version James prefers, prefers the word minister, the word or, minister servant. or servant. Toward the end of the first century, these roles began to change. The function of elder and and bishop separated. Circumstances led the church to elevate one of the elders to a higher leadership function and designated him as the bishop. In the next lecture, I'll explain these changes and explain the causes and their unintended consequences.